YOLO! Happy Wednesday. How we doing? It is the worst day of the week, as I like to think. Uh, but it doesn't feel that bad. It's actually a pretty solid Wednesday. I had a pretty productive week, uh, day yesterday. Tuesday. Um, nice little gender reveal for my cousin Jess. Um, she's having a girl. And get this. They're going to name the girl after her late father who just passed away. My Uncle Bill uh, passed away uh, this past October. Actually, it was my dad's birthday was the day he died, October 22nd. Um, uh, so they'll be naming the girl Billy, I-E, B-I-L-L-I-E, Billy. And, and you know, I'm kind of a fan of... Uh, of guy names for girls. No homo. Um, my ex was named Ricky. Her name was Erica. But people called her Ricky. And it was spelled R-I-C-K-I. It's a powerful I there to make it feminine. Um, and I think it's cool. I mean, you know, nothing wrong with a classic feminine name. But it's kind of a power move when you meet a girl named, like, Billy. Like, that's a standout thing, you know? Be, uh, Billy Jean. Oh, also, her middle name will be James, which I, I like because that's kind of named after me. Now, it's technically, I'm assuming, named after my grandfather, my papu on the Greek side, whose name is Demetrius, but he moved to... Uh, America from Greece and had his name legally changed to just James. So his legal name is James. I am technically named after my grandfather. Um, my name, my real name is Demetrius. Uh, but people just call me Jimmy. But if you look at my ID, the name James or Jimmy is nowhere to be found. It's Demetrius is my first name and Spanos is my middle name, uh, which was his last name. So technically I am named after my grandfather, but because of the old Ellis Island switcheroo, I wound up with the Greek name, and he wound up with the American name. And he was born in Greece. So, joke's on you, Papu. But, uh, my cousin's daughter will be named Billy James, which is great, dude. Billy James, not my daughter. In fact, I think that song Billie Jean is the only evidence in world history of a female being named Billie. I've never heard. Oh, wait. Hold on. What do I think of? Billie Eilish. Billie Holiday. Okay, never mind. I rescind my statement. It's perfectly normal to be named Billie. Uh, I didn't think of that yet. Whoa. Whoa. I also didn't know how gender reveals work. I had all, for whatever reason... It's one of those things that you just don't think about, I guess. Um, I kind of, I guess, imagined that it was like the parents' way of revealing the gender to everyone else. Like, hey, surprise, grandma and friends and cousins and brothers and sisters of the mother and father this is the gender of our baby, and we already know what it's going to be. We just can't wait to surprise you with some kind of creative, fun little, you know, reveal. I was actually surprised to know my cousin Jess, who's having the baby, also did not know the gender of her baby. Her sister, my other cousin, Jamie, who's the godmother, uh, was the only person that knew. She went to the doctor's office and got the results. And then she conducted this whole thing where she made cupcakes, uh, filled the cupcakes with uh, blue or pink icing, and that was the gender reveal. We all bit into the cupcake at the same time, looked at the cup, looked at the icing, boom, it was pink. Now, that was my idea, and I'll never get credit for that, and that's fine. Look, I don't, I don't live for credit. I just live to put stuff out there. P if, you know, but I definitely... I almost wonder if it was my idea to do a gender real, reveal at all. Because I distinctly remember bringing that up um, on like Thanksgiving. Because she, she told the whole family on Thanksgiving. 
very early in too, like three weeks into her pregnancy, which is like, I guess, frowned upon in society. I've heard a rule that you're really not supposed to tell anybody you're pregnant until like a certain amount of weeks. I'm so glad my family isn't like that. I'm so glad we're not like that. Like there's so many like, just like, you have to do it this way. It's like, look, you're my fucking cousin. We're very, very close. You know, our family is very close knit. If you're pregnant, we're all pregnant. You know, like, I, I'm saying that half kidding, but half not. Like, we're going to go through this together as a family. I understand if you don't want to announce it to the world or, you know, your outer circle of friends, but I do feel like, you know, your close friends, yeah, there's nothing wrong with telling them. You know, my look, my mom had two miscarriages. Uh, she had a miscarriage, then me, then another miscarriage, then Dom, which I guess is kind of like a halfway between miscarriage and regular human being. <laughs> but we'll go with two, two and not two and a half miscarriages. Um, so I should have had an older brother. But the thing is, I, I'm sure that my mom told the family when she was pregnant, you know, with me and the miscarriages, you know, what... I, I guess I just don't quite understand the concept. Like, you're not going to tell your mother that you're pregnant if you're a woman. You're going to wait the two months or three months or whatever they say it is. I don't think so. I don't think so. People are going to start getting a little suspicious when you show up to events and you don't drink. That's one thing. Hey, how come you're not drinking? Oh, no reason. Nothing. Nothing to see here. Just don't feel like drinking. Hmm. And, and look, it... it Again, everybody has their own boundaries and everybody kind of has their own way of doing things. Um, I just think for my preference, like my cousin, for instance, she was, uh, you know, we, were all, we already knew what the names were going to be if it was a girl or if it was a boy. We already knew that. My mom apparently didn't even find out the gender of any of her children until we were born. She had no idea I was going to be a boy until I came out. That's crazy. I almost wonder if that's the way to go. I don't know. My mom wanted to be, she says she wanted to be, my mom didn't even understand the concept of gender reveal. Here's how oblivious my mom was last night. I think she knew, she knew that the gender reveal, like the reason we were all going there is because we were all going to find out as a family, the gender of the baby. I don't think that the, the whole cupcake thing ever registered with her. We all we are all waiting there. There's a stack of cupcakes on the thing with blue and yellow, blue and pink wrapper. It's yellow icing. You know, everybody's there. We're we're all putting off eating these cupcakes. I don't know what was going through my mom's head. Like, why are we doing them? What's so special about the cupcakes? We all pass around a cupcake. Okay, nobody take out the toothpick. Nobody, nobody, because then you'll there'll be some icing on it. You don't want to see blah blah blah. Doesn't take out the toothpick. Okay, everybody, one, two, three, bite. We take a bite. We look at the icing. Everybody, oh my God, it's a girl. Wow, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. My mom, five seconds in, 10 seconds in, after everybody's like, kind of like, wait, how do we all know it's a girl? No concept. No idea that the whole purpose of this was to bite into the cupcake and look at the icing. With every single possible context clue. It was amazing. It was almost one of those things where someone is so oblivious, it almost, it almost makes you mad. For a brief moment, instead of just being like, are you serious, mom? Like, how, come on, how do you not? There was a brief moment where I was like, mom, I'm almost pissed off. You, for one half of a millisecond, I was angry. It was like, there's no way. There's no way. You can be this far on planet Neptune. But that's just my mom, man. She's, you know, she just... She just does things the Irene way. You know, it's cool. It served her well. Um, But yeah, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I went down to an audition in D.C. last night. That was fun. I'm sorry I'm, I'm spending so much time talking about me. Me, 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 do re me, me, 
But a lot of stuff happened yesterday. What do you want me to do? You want me to sit here and talk about fucking Taylor Swift again for another 30 minutes? For a second day in a row? Is that what you want? You want me to talk about uh, sports? You want me to talk about, uh, you know, Iran bombing a U.S. base in Jordan? Escalating us towards World War III? Is that, what, is that important to you? That's what you want from me? Well, maybe I will talk about that. But first, let's discuss my audition. I uh, drove down uh, to D.C., Falls Church, Virginia. Um, Nova for a, an audition for like a corporate band. It's going to be an 11-piece band, three horns, drummer, guitarist, keyboardist, four vocalists. Is that 11? I guess a bassist is a bass. What I, I don't remember seeing a bassist. Does our band not have a bassist? I'm saying this like I'm in the band. I don't know. Who am I looking? Who am I asking my fucking microwave right now? Hey, degree deodorant. Hey, drill charger that doesn't work. Does the band that I haven't been yet accepted to have a bassist, four vocalists, guitarist, keyboardist, three horns, drummer. It's got to be a bassist, right? Yeah, that's only 10 without the bassist. So, okay, bassist. There's a bassist, hopefully. I don't remember seeing one, but bassist kind of, they fade in the background anyway. They, I mean, bassists are cool, but if you're going to forget that somebody was there, it's going to be the bassist. Unless you're like in like a funk band or something. But it was cool. It was nothing. This audition was nothing like I expected it. I've only ever auditioned for a very small handful of things in my life, majority of which were church plays. Um, when I was a kid, I did a Peabody audition, um, which I was accepted to and then turned down. I just wanted to see if I could make it. Probably should have gone to Peabody. Um uh, I mean, talent show auditions, but for school talent shows and stuff, I've done that. I've all, now that I'm thinking about it, I've done, I mean, look, I've obviously done more auditions than the average person in life. But as far as like a, a someone who's been performing and doing music my entire life, you would assume that I'd probably done more than I have. Um, and I think most of the auditions you can't count like repeat ones. Like you can't count like, okay, I, this is the fourth year in a row that I'm doing a school talent show audition. Like I only count one per new thing. So, you know, the church play, I did that three years in a row. I did every church talent show, but I'm going to count that as two auditions, one for the talent show, one for the play. That's it. I'm not going to count that as seven auditions. But yeah, this was nothing like I, I expected. I, Mike text, Mike, my friend Mike Manos texted me about it like a night, two nights ahead of time, just to kind of like in passing, like, oh, by the way, you should check this thing out, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Um, I'm like, okay. So I, I hit up the dude and get some basic information from him. I wind up calling him, asking him some questions, had a nice 15-minute conversation, discuss what, what it is, blah, blah, blah. I was imagining driving down and like going to someone's basement or something and having it be like a handful of people there, like four or five people there, like maybe, maybe like, you know, some of the rhythm section, just kind of like get a vibe, like how well you can sing and stuff. Dude, I pulled up to this place, gigantic studio. Gigantic studio. I walk in a run room, I see a band rehearsing, and I go, hey, is Brian here? And one guy goes, yeah, I'm Brian, what's up? And I'm like, yeah, I was looking for, uh, I, I was, nice to meet you, man. I, we talked on the phone yesterday. He's like, huh? No, I do. I was a totally different Brian. Totally different Brian. So then I'm like, so do you know where the audition's in? Like, I don't know, but there's a big room over there. So I go over there. I walk into a room and there's like 50 freaking people in there. A whole band set up in the center of the room. Guy on the mixing board, mixing the whole thing. Two guys, three guys in the back, just like watching auditions. Mike is on stage. I didn't get a chance to see him perform, but he had just gotten finished when I walked in the room. Um, and I'm sitting there like, oh, this is this is real. I mean, I, I really didn't put too much effort into preparing for the audition because, you know, A, I had the benefit of the doubt of the fact that I found out about this last night. He sent me an email at like 9 p.m. the night before. And it was for like, uh, you know, eight, 10 song set list. 
that like he was like, look, just know the male songs. I'm like, okay, I'll learn the male songs. I know Uptown Funk. If you've ever, if you've ever been to a wedding or any function, you know Uptown Funk. It's unfortunately one of the most overplayed event songs of all time. I think it's sad for uh, certain songs that they're so overplayed because the fact that they're so overplayed makes people then hate them. They hate the songs. I got an argument with my brother the other day, Don't Stop Believing," which was a song on this set list as well. I, like, oh, I can't stand that song. And I'm saying like, dude, okay, first of all, objectively, Don't Stop Believing" is an amazing song. It's anthemic. The guitar solo is sick. It's catchy. The message is good. The lyrics are good and memorable and iconic. Just a small town girl living in a lonely world. That's just the first line. I mean, that's not a, an amazing line, but you know, the whole thing. Paying anything to roll the dice just one more time. Some will win. Some will lose. Some are born to sing the blues. That's not how I really sing. I feel like a douche if I just like really ripped it on here. Some will win. It's like, dude, relax. It's Wednesday. Uh, a great song. Don't stop believing. Hold on to that feeling. Street lights. People. Oh, oh, street lights, people, ha, ha, ha. come on. It's a great song. The fact that the fact that you hear it everywhere you go does not make it a bad song. You can say you're tired of it. What you can't say is that it's a not a good song. I told my brother, I said, Dom, okay, picture yourself for a moment. Picture you're in the studio. The year is 1980, whatever, whatever year Journey made that song, record that song. You're in the studio. The piano comes in. The guitarist, Neil Schoen, we need something to bring us into the next thing. Um, fucking Steve Perry comes in. Uh, just a city boy. You're like, ooh, this sounds good. Okay. And then the guitarist during the break. <laughs> you're sitting in the studio and you're like, dude, what are we doing right now? This is um, unreal. I cannot believe we're making this song right now. That's how good that shit was. I don't care what the fuck you say. If you were in that studio in 1980-whatever, and you're sitting there listening to them play it, coming up with parts, now nah, I think you should maybe do like... It's a magical experience. It's a magical culmination of everything to create this rock anthem. It's not their fault that people liked it so fucking much that they never stopped playing it and started playing it for everything and you got tired of it. So now you can sit here 30 years later, 40 years later, almost. Ugh, this fucking song sucks. I hate that song. Fuck off. Just say you're tired of it. Don't disrespect rock history like that. Uptown Funk, like it or not, you liked it when the song came out. You liked it. Don't fucking... Everybody likes to pretend like the year 2013 didn't happen. Everybody likes to pretend that when Macklemore came out with Thrift Shop, people weren't digging it. Everybody likes to pretend that that 
in the moment, in the early 2010s, we all were living through it with our 2024 um, perspective. No, we weren't. We weren't. You can look back and acknowledge that songs like Uptown Funk are overplayed and kind of corny. Um, uh, you know, Macklemore is lame as shit. But you, what you can't do is act like, you know, I don't know why it was so popular in 2013. I certainly didn't. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. Okay, when the music video for Uptown Funk came out and they're all on the street doing the too hot, hot damn, getting their fucking hair. That's a good music video. That's the problem. Uptown Funk is a good song. It's a, it's a well-produced song. I mean, everything that went into it, I'm going to have some fucking music nerd. <laughs> well, you realize how much they ripped off. Okay, okay. Hey, I, I've seen a couple YouTube videos where they like played a clip of like something else from some like blues guy or whatever from like the 60s and it was like oh yeah for sure they ripped that off that's every song that's every song pop music there's like four or five chord combinations now uptown funk was a little more egregious than other songs i think they even lost in a lawsuit um but whatever whatever okay so the guy got his if he, if they lost in the lawsuit then that means the guy got his money so everybody wins everybody wins Uptown Funk became this hugely popular song that made millions and millions and millions of dollars. Um, the guy who they stole that one little, uh, you know, line from or whatever thing in like the bridge, uh, he got his money. Everybody's happy. Everybody wins. So now we're just looking at a song that a lot of people made a lot of money off of and a lot of people liked and the video is good. Now, does that mean I want to play it? Every fucking show for the rest of my life? No. I've never played that song on my own accord. I've had to sing it in multiple bands, but never on my own volition. Um, anyway, what the hell am I talking about? So those songs like that are on this set list. You know, look, I had a conversation, uh, the other day with some fellow musicians and we were kind of just talking. I was double booked at the horse uh, on Saturday and I wound up just drinking there all day, which was ill-advised to say the least. Um, and throughout the course of the day, I found myself in conversations with various different people because I was there for seven fucking hours. So it was almost like I was holding a fucking uh, a telethon at the bar seat where just you, the owner passes through. We talk about DeSantis dropping out of the race and politics and cancel culture uh, you know, some other musician pulls through. We're talking about taking requests, you know, you, you know, just just I'm just I'm just a fixture at this bar on Saturday talking to everybody, getting gradually more drunk. Um, but we we spoke about, you know, when bartenders hate songs like Wagon Wheel and uh, shit like that. Ah, here's every fucking guy plays this song. Jesus Christ. What you got, I said, look, a man named Stevie Matthews told me this, who now has moved to Austin, Texas, but I actually learned a surprising amount from him. He was a guy who was only a couple years older than me, uh, did the same thing as me, full-time musician, guitar singer, singer, songwriter, whatever, um, and I played a couple gigs with him when he had laryngitis, so I got him to play lead for me, and so on those gigs, we, we got to know each other pretty well, got along great, and... Uh, I learned a couple things. I learned, A, to just start taking requests. I never used to take requests like that. I used to um, just kind of do stuff that I was confident. Um, and then he taught me that, you know, taking requests is, is really a, a, probably the most effective way to engage with the crowd. The crowd wants to feel like it's an interactive experience. You know, if, they're, if they just feel like they're sitting there listening to a radio station, then, you know... Maybe you can luck out if they really like your selection, but also like, you know, they, they kind of want it to be more like a jukebox, you know, and some, look, 
you got to read the room and you got to see which is better. You obviously, you know, you can't just be playing fucking anything they ask you and embarrassing yourself. You know, I don't do that shit. I'm not going to, hey, play um, Mo Bamba. I got hoes calling my motherfucking phone. I'm not doing that shit. All right. Now, I get it. It's a funny request. It might be funny the first, like, line of the song. And then it just, it's like, it's corny. I'm not doing that, okay? If you but if you request a song that is a reasonable song that you actually want to hear because you actually enjoy it and you actually would like to see my rendition of it, then I will do it so long as I have a decent idea of the song in its entirety or at least enough to pull it off and upon seeing the chords and you know confirming that it's not incredibly difficult. Um, which most songs are not. So he taught me that to do that, and that actually it I it, it was a it created a noticeable effect in my tips for sure. The other thing he told me was when you're met with those bartenders talking, about, ah, you get that look uh, when they you play wagon wheel. Oh, here we go. Hey, uh, are you playing wagon wheel again? Hey, are you making a gin and tonic again? Oh, did you just serve another Miller Lite? Every time you come in here, you pour somebody a, a Miller Lite. I mean, it's like every time I come in here, you're making a Jack and Coke. Do something. Else. No, that's what people like, dude. That's what people like, okay? You're a bartender. You serve drinks. I'm a musician. I serve jams, okay? And there you have your, you have your popular jams. Just like you have your popular drinks, you have songs that are staples they are standards, and you have to know them, and you pretty much have to do them. You know? That's just how it goes. So, you know, whenever you hear from anybody about any of this shit, like, they just don't know what they're fucking talking about. They don't. Um... But yeah, as soon as I walked in the room, I, I met with this situation, 50 musicians. They're auditioning for all, all kinds of different things. There's people there to audition for the horn section. There's people there auditioning as drummers. So they're just swapping people out and just running through the set list. I had no fucking idea what, what I was doing. I had no fucking idea. As soon as I walk in the room, all right, get up there. You good to jump in? Get up. I'm still in my fucking pea coat. I didn't know I was going to be standing in front of 50 fucking people. And a panel of judges, like I'm auditioning for Saturday Night Live. Barely knew the lyrics to any of the songs. We don't even discuss who's going to sing what. You know, there's two girls next to me and then a guy to my right. So two girls, two guys. All I knew was the guys sing the guy songs and the girls sing the girls songs. Now it's pretty much assumed that, you know, songs like uh, Don't Stop Till You Get Enough by Michael Jackson, although that is a male song, girl sings that usually same with don't stop believing that's a that's unfortunately a girl song i think it would be fucking crazy to see a guy pull off that song like the right way i do that song but i transpose it down like four keys and you know still play a bastardized version of it but you know decent enough to get people into it but i you know i i usually only do that song by request um but like it would be crazy just to see a guy like nail you know songs like a lot of that 80s like hair metal shit pop metal shit uh it, you know those guys sing high like some um fucking uh sweet child of mine sweet child they all sang like that like how the fuck am i supposed to sing that dude Every time you see Guns and Rose, every time you see a band do Sweet Child of Mine, you're going to see it being done by a chick singer or Don't Stop Believing or anything like that. You shook me all night long. You shook me all night long. That's going to be a chick singer. Um, generally speaking, unless it's like an actual tribute band. Like the only time you're going to see a male vocalist do that do that song is if that band is specifically like I saw an ACDC tribute band 
at Secrets in Ocean City last summer. And, you know, obviously when you're a tribute band, it, you're not just going to play a bunch of their shit. You kind of like look the part. Like, you know, the lead singer is dressed like fucking Bon Scott or whatever, the lead singer with the fucking hat and everything, leather jacket. And then, you know, the guitarist is dressed like Angus Young with the schoolboy outfit and doing the fucking hopping across the stage. I saw uh, a Leonard Skinner tribute band a year prior. Same type of deal. They all look like the guys. That's part of the thing. And I also saw a Journey tribute band at Secrets uh, last summer as well. So I, I guess the common denominator is they seem to do a lot of tribute bands. Um, so they play exclusively this band, which is kind of crazy because, like, I don't know if there's any band that I would consider good enough to fill up a four-hour gig of just their stuff. Even the bands themselves only play, like, one or two hours max at in concert. They're not running through their whole catalog. You know how good you have to be as a band to be able to fill up four hours of quality shit that's just yours? The Beatles can maybe do that. The Eagles can maybe do that. Eagles are probably one of the more underrated rock bands of all time. They do not get enough credit for uh, the amount of fucking bangers they put out. Just the amount of good music they put out. From all, the, 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 I think they're the only band in American rock history to have a number one song under four different vocalists. Because you have Glenn Fry, who was like the guy with the long hair and the mustache, and he did most of the singing in the very early days. You know, he's the guy who sang like Take It Easy and Witchy Woman. Basically, he does the singing on most of the Eagles more like country rock shit. You know, they're more laid back country rock stuff. Then you have Don Henley, who's arguably one of the best rock vocalists of all time. Not because he had this amazing range or that he was singing these crazy licks and shit, but he just had a clean, good vocal. He, he just had a clean voice. Like, it just sounded good, you know? He wasn't doing all that Bon Scott raspy shit or fucking squealing super high notes. He just had a good fucking voice, you know? That's the kind of shit I like. Hey, can you just be good? What happened to good? Why does everything have to be distinct? And, and you know, I you want to have an authentic voice. I hate that fucking thing theater voice i have a dream a most wonderful dream i can go the distance i will find my way that fucking disney voice obviously i hate that shit the best singer should sound like they're talking in song that should be how your voice sounds or else it's not real. You can have a great singing voice, but the most authentic, in my opinion, are the people who just can go from talking to singing like that because that's their voice. They're not, they don't have a separate singing voice. Oh, I talk like this. You know, like Justin Timberlake has a good singing voice, but then he does all that falsetto shit. <laughs> You talk like that? Hey, what's up? I'm Justin Timberlake. You know, I get it. You want to do some falsetto shit, but a lot of it's... I don't know. I never got the hype around his 2020 album. It didn't even come out in 2020. Uh, came out well before. But, like, girls were, like, obsessed with that fucking album. Just because it was like the cool thing to be into, you know? I was like, oh my God. I fucking love Justin Timberlake's new album. I fucking obsess with it. So good. It's like a masterpiece. Um, I don't know. Justin Timberlake, obviously immensely talented, funny, great actor, great musician, but I don't know. What's wrong with the little Don Henley, just natural voice singing? I sound like a dick right now because Justin Timberlake mostly sings normally. And as much as I was a Backstreet Boys fan 
growing up because that was like that divide the in sync versus backstreet boys and then if you were a complete fucking freak like like goonies uh chunk level baby ruth level freak then you like 98 degrees but i was a bsb man i was a i was a backstreet boys boy I felt like they were the kind of more like the underdogs. I felt like NSYNC was the more like popular ones and Backstreet Boys were kind of like the alt, the alt boy band, like the underground fucking counterculture boy band. <laughs> I think on paper, the Backstreet Boys may have been more successful now that I think about it, which I don't, I don't know if that's true. I think they were managed by the same guy. I watched like a whole documentary about it. Um, just crazy learning about like behind the scenes of, and like they were just getting completely fucked over money wise and everything. But um, in my older age, I, looking back, I kind of feel like NSYNC might have had more bangers. Um, and And there's no question that of those people... Justin Timberlake was the most talented of everyone in in sync and the Backstreet Boys. Like, I think the different. I, I, here's how I describe it. I think in sync was very top heavy in regards to talent and looks. Like in sync, the Backstreet Boys had Nick Carter, who was like their main guy. I would say just Nick Nick Carter was like the Harry Styles, the Justin Timberlake, like every boy band has like the main boy, you know? And that was Nick Carter for the Backstreet Boys. And then um, you have your second tier guy. That would be like, you know, for One Direction, that would be like Zayn. Zayn was probably like the second, like the back, the 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 B-side main guy. Zayn Malik um, for One Direction. In in sync, that was definitely JC Chazé or whatever. And then in the Backstreet Boys, it's kind of a tough call. I would probably say I I would say there probably was no definitive like main second guy. There was no like definitive silver medalist in the Backstreet Boys and that's kind of what I think made them better because in all those other bands like uh in sync Justin Timberlake immensely talented great singer JC Chazé great singer like he had a good voice he was a really good singer and then everyone else Lance Bass Joey Fatone the other fucking guy with like the dreadlocks or whatever, not good looking, uh, not that great at singing and just kind of like there. Like it was, it was Justin Timberlake and JC Chazé and then just these other three fucking losers. No offense, but anybody could have replaced them. You know, they were just, they were filler guys. Um, One Direction, I would argue pretty similar. I would definitely argue it's pretty similar type of setup where Harry Styles and Zayn Malik were like obviously the main two guys. And you had like Niall Horan who was like the bronze medalist, like he, not quite a filler guy, but definitely not who anybody was going to go into a concert to see. And then I don't even remember the other two guys. I don't know who the other two guys were. Um, the interesting thing about them is Zayn was definitely the most talented, best singing voice. Harry's, uh, I'm sorry. I don't, I hate to sound like a hater. I am a musician. So whenever I criticize musicians, I sound like a hater. Here's this is the catch 22 of, of where I'm coming from when it comes to that, when it comes to critiquing people, I uh, admonished myself early in the week for being too hard on Lamar um, and decided that, you know, because I've never achieved anything to that magnitude um, uh, that, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not in a place 
and I and I'm not like that immersed in sports to that level. I'm not in a place to like hurl insults or like crit- criticisms at Lamar. So I I dialed it back and I toned it back to just you know where I felt was a more appropriate way to go about it. I'm not a professional athlete. I never pursued athletics to any type of actually high level. Um, so, you know, I dialed back my criticisms. Then I get to a field that I actually do feel like I can speak to. I'm a professional musician, obviously not to the magnitude of the people I'm talking about, but I'm still a professional musician. I do it for a living. That's how I pay my bills. Um, and then I feel like if I criticize them, it sounds like I'm being a hater. So it's like either I have no room to talk because I'm not the thing or I am the thing and now I'm just being a hater because they're more successful at the thing than I am. It's like, all right, at a certain point, I just got to say what the fuck I got to say. And I'm just going to say it. I don't think Harry Styles and those other guys, pretty much anyone besides Zayn, including Zayn, basically, I'm not, I don't think any of those guys were standout talents. I really fucking don't. Um, if you ever watched the original, like, Britain's Got Talent, or where there was a show that they all five auditioned for, I don't think any one of them went far in the show. But, you know, once they all came across Simon Cowell's desk, he kind of was like, look, none of you guys are individually good enough to be a pop star. But the five of you together, you know, you're all good looking. You can all carry a tune and, you know, kind of sing okay. The five of you together could be a, a powerhouse. So he took all five of them and made up a boy band. Five is the magic number for boy bands. It's the common formula. Backstreet Boys, five guys. In sync, five guys. One Direction, five guys. Uh, 98 Degrees, five guys. All of them. Um, but you watch those auditions and like Harry Styles was like completely off key. during. It's like, oh, he's nervous. It's like, all right, look. I don't care how nervous. Everyone's nervous. Everyone that's ever done an audition for American Idol was nervous, I would imagine, to one degree or another. Harry Styles was certainly not any more nervous than the guy who went before him or after him, all right? He's fucking up on stage right now, performing to millions of people for a living every fucking day and all over the news and in the public eye and everything, Okay, clearly he, he, his mind is able to cope with being the center of attention um, and being in the limelight. So I don't think it's uh, fair to, oh, no, well, the reason why he did so poorly in his audition because he was nervous. Okay, well, then nobody can ever be said to have had a bad audition because pretty much everyone is nervous. No, I'm holding him to the same standards as everyone else. You had an audition. It sucked. You were off key. You were told to stop. You had to start over. And now, here we are, what, 10 years later, and I have to hear about him being a fucking musical genius? I'm sorry, I don't think a musical genius could sing off key in an audition if he tried. I just, I I don't know how you could hear music and then sing the wrong notes if you are a musical genius. If you are a prodigy, if you are an immense talent, I'm sorry, I don't see it. I don't see it with Harry Styles. You know, people want to talk about, oh, man, they write their own music. and but Let's define writing your own music, okay? Because again, this is something I do for a living. I've written and recorded many songs that no one gives a fuck about, but that's not the point. What I can speak to is not having a Grammy or platinum records, but what I can speak to is what it really means to write and record a song. Not have an idea and like three chords and like a you know primitive version of a melody or a hook and then sit down with four of the top producers in the world and my other bandmates who are all touring musicians uh you know and then you know sit there with the best songwriters at the record label and and like you know basically concoct an entire song with this amazing demo and get all these people involved and then uh, you know, I walk into the studio. I don't know, guys. I got this idea. It's kind of like uh, watermelon sugar high, watermelon sugar 
high, watermelon sugar high. And they're like, okay, okay, what's it about? It's like, I don't know. It's kind of going to be like a veiled metaphor for eating pussy, I guess. Okay, tight. The young girls are going to love that. All right. Um, I don't know. Swayze. Uh, Mike made it. Ill Will. Can we bring Ill Will from back from the dead? Kanye. I'm just naming producers that have nothing to do with this song, probably. But regardless, you get what I'm saying. Like, hey, DJ Khaled, can we get another one? Yeah. DJ Khaled. We the best. So you get these guys in there. Hey, uh, Rick Rubin, greatest recording engineer slash producer of all time. We got an idea. It goes watermelon sugar high. Watermelon sugar high. Next thing you know, it's the fucking watermelon sugar high. It's like, and then, and then they, oh yeah, Harry Styles wrote that song, man. Like Harry Styles fucking came in with acoustic guitar with the whole fucking thing, made a demo, fucking decided on the arrangement. Bull fucking shit. I'm sorry. Bullshit. Maybe Taylor Swift does something a little closer to that, but I don't even buy it with her. She's a great songwriter. But, you know, there's a fucking difference between uh, coming up with a song with some words and a melody and some chords and then there's a whole fucking long road between sitting on your couch with an acoustic guitar and mumbling a song and a melody to some chords that sound good uh, and then taking it to the level of a fully produced song where you've decided, okay, yeah, I wrote this song on acoustic, but like, is, are there even going to be guitars in this song? Is this going to be more of a synthy song? Is it going to be a piano song? Are we going to have live drums? Are we going to use program drums? How should the bass line go? What about, um, you know, the, the should the pre-chorus go here? Blah, blah, blah. These, are le- uh, these are levels of production and song creation that I think these artists take... F- they are... I don't know if they take the credit, but they are given far too much credit for their actual amount of contribution to the final product. These artists are more performers than they are artists. They are. They are. Okay? In the 50s, you had guys like Frank Sinatra. They would, you know, they had they had musical standards at the time. You know, you look at old songs and like, you know, every big singer at the time had their version of this song or that song and like, you know, and then, you know, they had all these like, uh, you know, just jazz club type of songs and big band music. And then you would do your thing and blah, blah. Frank Sinatra was a karaoke song, karaoke singer. I, I'm not, I don't know if he ever wrote a song for himself in his life. I don't know if Elvis ever really uh, wrote a significant amount of his music. You know, these bands like that, like the Jackson 5 and, you know, everybody, the Temptations, everybody, they were karaoke singers, essentially. Their job was to have great music written and produced for them, and then their talent was to sing it and perform it. You know? I mean, I realize that, you know, now that I've been on this long fucking tangent about music in general, but I realized that at the band, I've never really been in a situation where I had that many components working for me at the same time. Even just standing in a room and performing a song with a bunch of people I never met, and I have a horn section and a drummer and a keyboardist and a lead guitarist, and I, you know, normally I have to play guitar. Uh, that's what I, you know, and, and now I'm just sitting there singing and all I have to do is sing. And when you're just singing and Everything else is happening around you. There's a guy on the soundboard mixing it live, and there's a guy fucking doing the lights, and there's another guy doing the other things, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like you get to a certain level and you realize, like, my level of involvement in the final product is so much more of a percentage than any of the people that I'm discussing right now. And that's just a fact, okay? 
regardless of the magnitude that I'm discussing, when I show up to a fucking gig, I'm setting up the speakers. I'm making sure that the sound is right, EQ and shit, making sure the levels are good. I'm playing the music. I'm singing the music. You know, when it comes to uh, original music, Joe and I are writing the shit. We come in here, you know, even people that fucking, you know, hip hop guys, they, they fucking download a fucking sample off, you know, uh, you know, no shade to what my brother Dom does or whatever. But like there's a fucking difference between sitting there and coming up with a melody completely from scratch, figuring out how to play that on guitar, figuring out how the bass should go with that, what the drum beat should be, how the vocal melody should be, recording all those things, getting the tones just right, getting how ex the bass exactly how you want it to sound, getting the guitar crunch level perfect and blah, blah, blah. And every step of the way, every single layer of that song is from scratch. And then you record it and you get somebody to mix it for you, you know, which was even that was a new development, a massive fucking development for me. And then, you know, get somebody to master it and then release it and it's like, I don't think that's what Taylor Taylor Swift or Harry Styles are doing. Okay, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go ahead and and put it out there. Bullshit. I don't think anybody thinks that that's what they do, but I think people just don't think about it. And because they don't understand everything that goes into it, they assume that because somebody has catchy music and a good voice, that they're this amazing artist. When in reality they may very well just be a really good performer. There's a lot of hands in the pot and a lot of money going around and a lot of pieces of the pie to divide up that goes into every single thing that you see mass produced on the level we're discussing, whether it comes from movies or music or whatever. So I think, you know, to kind of bring this whole thing full circle... I've kind of spent my entire career, if you even want to call it that, um, basically uh, like averse to being controlled. I never wanted to lose my creative freedom. That was always the most important thing to me. I could ne I was never a good employee in that. Like I was a good employee in that I would try my best, but I was going to do things my way. And the boss employee relationship was only going to work in so far as uh my way of doing shit did not interfere with their business and how they wanted their business to run because at the end of the day when i worked at abercrombie i was not going to say that hey the tagline hey did you know your pants can make you a star that i was supposed to say when i was standing up front to every single person who walked in i wasn't going to fucking buy the clothes i thought the clothes were gay so they had a rule that was like, all right, you don't have to technically wear Abercrombie clothes, but, you know, so I didn't. I didn't. Um, you know, and same thing at every place I did. So I couldn't do that musically either. I couldn't take myself fucking seriously if I was just up there singing some bullshit bubblegum stuff and pretending to be this person that I'm not and, you know, whatever. Um, and so I never did that. But yeah, that's the point, I guess, what I'm getting at is, is uncertainty and unfamiliarity breeds intimidation. So when you're on the outside looking in, all this stuff looks like magic and you can't imagine how it's actually getting done. But the only way that you get over that is by just immersing yourself in it. And so all of a sudden, all those things that seemed like magic before now you peek behind the curtain you see how it's actually done and it starts to make sense and it starts to feel more viable more manageable like oh yeah well yeah okay well yeah that's how that gets done that guy over there is doing it and oh that guy over there does this and she does this and oh and then all of a sudden i would imagine you realize that actually the shit that you've been doing on your own was actually more fucking stressful than the shit you'd have to be doing uh, that you thought was magic, and in reality, it wasn't magic. It was just other people doing it. But yeah, so moral of the story is fucking just go out and fucking do it, you know? You'll realize that, that it's not all it's cracked up to be. Nothing is, ever. Um, Guys, let's close out the show. I have no idea what the purpose of this, this show was. I mean, I think I touched upon some things. 
covered a lot of different topics. I don't know if any of them are applicable or interesting to you. But, I mean, that's what I wanted to talk about today. That's what was on my mind. Um, let me leave you with some picks. Uh, the Rook Looks. I didn't give out a look yesterday. I'm not going to tell you what it was because I may or may not have lost. But because I did not announce the pick to you, then it it can't count against me. It can't. Uh, but I will announce a couple picks for you today. Um, a couple bonuses on the books. DraftKings has like a, you know, goal in the first 10 minutes of the game for the Kings Predators hockey game. I just always take those because they're positive EV. Or actually, it's MGM, bet MGM that's doing that. It's like a minus 150 that's boosted to plus 115. 115, I, I, I put money on whatever. I'm not counting those a rook look. I'm just letting you know that that bonus exists. Um, however... Uh, on DraftKings, a couple bonuses. We got an a NBA no sweat bet, which is your money back if you lose as a bonus bet. And uh, a, I believe, 33% boost on parlays for, I think, college basketball, yes. So, for the NBA, I'm tossing $25 no sweat bet on the Washington Wizards plus 12 against the Clippers tonight. It's at Washington. Um, my model shows Wizards as 11 and a half point underdogs. You know, 12 point handicap is slightly better than that. I'll take it. It's it's a 30, it's a no sweat bet. So I'm getting a half point advantage and uh, my money back if I lose. So why the fuck not? Um, yeah, Wizards plus 12 tonight. Uh, parlay wise, on DraftKings, there's a 33% single game parlay slash single game parlay plus uh, boost. Um, minimum three legs. So, uh, my favorite college pick tonight, my favorite look is is Notre Dame plus 12 and a half against Virginia. I think that's I, I'm, that's the one I'm most confident about. There's a couple good games coming on tonight. Um I tried to pick the games that are going to be on television. Um, not that I have ESPN anymore on my package, but like these are games that could be on at a bar or if you have basic cable, you could watch without having to fucking stream and shit like that. So, um, you know, I just think that's more fun. You know, I, I also kind of use the games that are on TV as more of like a barometer as to how good of a game they're projected to be because they're obviously going to want to televise the, the best games. So I figured, okay, if these are the best games, I, I don't care enough about college basketball to be betting on fucking Coppin State versus um, fucking, you know, University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Like, you know, I want to, you know, put some money on a game that, that I can watch and, and it matters. Um, so I parlayed Notre Dame plus 12 and a half while also taking the under in that game as well. Um, the underline is super low. It's over under 115. I think the average points in a total points or line in a game is 140 for college basketball. Something like that, 135 to 140 or something. 115 is extremely low. My model is showing even lower. My model is showing over under 105 for this Notre Dame Virginia game tonight. That is extremely low. Both of these teams. Uh, play at a very slow pace, as they call it. Not a lot of possessions per game. They really take their time on possessions, which just amounts to less overall possessions in general, which, of course, amounts to less scoring. Um, so both of these teams uh, are play slow, and, and the combination of those two together means a very slow-paced game with not a lot of possession changes and therefore not a lot of scoring. So... And also, I think that, you know, the lower scoring a game is, the less likely it is that a team is going to beat another team by fucking 13 points. You know, that's just logical. If the over, if, a, if, a, if there's 180 points scored between the two teams, 
you know, you can have a larger disparity in the individual scores while still being believable. Like, okay, 180 points were scored. Maybe the team lost by 20. When you have a over, when you're expecting a 115 point game, Vegas is, how the fuck is one team going to beat the other team by 13 points? I mean, now you're talking like, I think Notre Dame would have to score like, uh, okay, 13 points. Virginia wins by 13 points and the total score is 115. I'm going to do math. I know this is boring, but just I just want to demonstrate kind of the thinking here so you can apply it to your betting, hopefully. Um, the the optimum score for a 13-point uh, win from Virginia while hitting 115 points would be, what, 65 to um, 52? No, 64 to 51. 64 to 51 would be the final score for a game in which uh, the total score is 115 and Virginia wins by 13. Does anybody really think Notre Dame's only going to score 50 points tonight? I mean, that's exceedingly low. That's exceedingly low. Um, I just don't see it. So I'm very confident in that in that those first two legs of the parlay. And then I also have um, Florida at Kentucky tonight. I'm just taking the over 170 and a half on that. And I'm parlaying those three. So that that boosted parlay on DraftKings, the three legs are Notre Dame plus 12 and a half versus Virginia and the under 115 um, on that game as well. And then also over 170 and a half for Florida versus Kentucky tonight as well. So those are the three legs. Um, Florida and Kentucky are both extremely fast-paced teams, high-scoring teams. They're going to compound in the other direction where that ball is going to be changed in a lot of hands, a lot, a lot of different possessions, a lot of scoring. So, uh, you know, my model says 178 and a half for that. So that's showing an eight-point advantage on the on this um, line, Vegas line. So that's the two DraftKings bets and another NBA boost on FanDuel. We are looking at a 30% NBA boost. Um, I'm tossing that on the Kings tonight. The Sacramento Kings are playing the Miami Heat. My model shows it as a dead even game. Now, normally, I don't fuck with plus one spreads because literally all it does is ensure that they can, uh, I guess you can push if they only manage to lose by one, which is like, I don't, who cares? Who cares? Like, if you're going to take a plus one, just take the money line. I mean, the odds of them losing by exactly one so you can push are very low. Um, they exist, and maybe in the long run it could pay off. I don't fucking know, but it, it's just, if you're going to take a team plus one, just take the fucking money line. However, I am taking plus one and a half because they could lose by one, and I could still win, not tie, not push. I could win the bet if they only lose by one, and my model is showing this is a dead-even game with a very very slight edge to Miami. I think like a half point advantage to Miami. So actually, technically, my model is not showing the Kings winning tonight, but it is showing the game being dead even. So I'll take the plus one and a half in that instance. Um, Yeah, so those are your three rook looks of the evening. Uh, Washington Wizards plus 12. Sacramento Kings plus one and a half and a college basketball parlay, Notre Dame plus 12 and a half, Notre Dame, Virginia under 115 and Florida, Kentucky over 170 and a half. Folks, my name is Jimmy Seleski. Happy Wednesday. Happy gambling. Happy living. Till tomorrow. Peace.